It's not hard here in San Antonio to find anything, just on the streets, anywhere. Addiction in my mind was never the problem, addiction was the solution. I started taking more because I thought if one was good, two or three would make me feel better. When I saw her sick and like going through all that pain that I caused her, that she did nothing to do, you know, to deserve it. One thing we have to be humble about, I think, is that I tell patients is that we cannot eliminate pain to 100%. That's just part of the human condition. When you're waking up every day and you need something to function, that's an addiction and it's a disease. The opioid epidemic is sweeping the country nationwide from East Coast to West Coast. The growing crisis hits home for about 56% of Americans. We've all heard of the celebrities who have died from an opioid or heroin overdose, including Prince, Elvis, and actor Heath Ledger, just to name a few. But the crisis could be as close as your friends and family. According to the CDC, since 1999, the number of people who have died from overdose has nearly quadrupled. 91 people each day die of an opioid overdose in the U.S. That's more than people who die in car crashes. That's why we here at KSAT, along with our parent company and sister stations from around the country, want to do our part in joining in on the national conversation on the opioid epidemic. And tonight, we're going to share with you stories from people who are facing addiction and also stories by those who are affected by someone they love who's addicted. Misusing prescription drugs may not sound like a big deal, but for many, misusing prescription opioids can be a gateway to heroin. About 80% of people in the U.S. who recently started using heroin said they took opioid pain relievers for non-medical reasons. And for many, getting unprescribed pain medication starts with a family member or a friend. More than half of the nearly 1,400 adults surveyed by the Kaiser Family Foundation say they have been addicted themselves, know someone who died from an overdose, know someone with an addiction, or know someone who took painkillers that weren't prescribed to them. And the opioid epidemic has huge financial implications for our country. The estimated total of economic burden from prescription opioid overdose abuse and dependence around $78.5 billion. After a two-year investigation, federal investigators have shut down a drug ring here in San Antonio that reportedly put thousands of potentially deadly fake prescription pills laced with fentanyl on the streets. As Charles Gonzalez explains, the investigation started on the campus of UTSA and on the streets, stretching back to the alleyways of the internet. Federal authorities arrested eight men and shut down a lab. The drug ring reportedly moved from this home in a quiet northwest side neighborhood to another home in suburban Houston. The ring was allegedly led by an Iraqi immigrant who served as an interpreter for U.S. military forces, 28-year-old Ala Mohammed Alawi. Another man, 25-year-old Benjamin Uno, is also accused of having a big role in the drug ring. The U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration says the group allegedly manufactured pain and anxiety pills laced with fentanyl or other drugs using commercial pill presses they got from China. Officials believe they also got the fentanyl from China. The drug ring would then sell the drugs on the streets and on the Internet. The pills were first seen in December of 2015 by UTSA police and SAPD on the school's campus and on the streets. Through the use of wiretaps, DEA investigators listened to the ring members discuss their business, including when they decided to move their lab from the home Alawi owned on Regency Bend near Hausman to a house he rented in Richmond near Houston. DEA agents moved in on the Richmond lab in mid-May this year and they seized a long list of items, including half a kilogram of powdered fentanyl, 10 kilos of oxycodone pills laced with fentanyl, half a kilo of crystal meth, five kilos of Adderall pills laced with meth, six kilos of Xanax pills laced with meth, four commercial pill press machines, three handguns, and a semi-automatic rifle. DEA agents also seized 120 packages of delivery-ready pills, and with the help of the U.S. Postal Service, at least 70 packages were intercepted, but thousands of orders had already been filled before the ring was shut down. In June, a federal grand jury indicted Alawi, Uno, and six other men. Two have been identified as Jason Salcedo and Trevor Robinson. All of the men have pleaded not guilty. 
One of the eight men has bonded out. The other remain in federal custody, including Alawi and Uno. A trial date has been set for November 13th. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that can be 50 to 100 times more potent than heroin, and two milligrams is all it takes to overdose. That amount is smaller than a penny. Fentanyl is so dangerous, first responders from detectives to paramedics are urged to take extra precautions to protect themselves from the deadly drug because it can be absorbed through the skin and inhaled if airborne. DEA agents say heroin laced with fentanyl is smuggled in from Mexico, but fentanyl is also being ordered and shipped in from China. A report by the National Center for Health Statistics shows overdose deaths from fentanyl doubled from 2013 to 2014. Don't be the mom that I was and don't say, oh, my kid would never, ever, ever do that. Always be on the alert. Always, always be on the alert. A mother in Michigan learned the hard way about this deadly drug. Her son was just 20 years old when he overdosed on heroin laced with fentanyl while away at college. You know, the last text I got from him the night before he died was, Mom, I need $40 for food. And apparently it wasn't for food. So that's how it all ended. That's the problem is the consumer. There's too many consumers giving their money to the drug dealers so they can continue to bring their stuff in here. And we need to fight, the committee needs to fight. While the opioid addiction can start with a prescription, it often leads people to the streets once they can no longer get those medications refilled. Robert Bogues is one of those people that supplies addicts with pills, pot, and powders that destroy their lives. He was a big time drug dealer who is now hoping to help families steer clear of addictive drugs. Kevin Dietz from our sister station WDIV in Detroit shares his story. I've seen more kids die from this. Um, they end up buying it on the street somewhere. Now they're paying 500 bucks a week for their Vicodin supply or whatever, Oxycontin, whatever it is. And somebody says, hey, you could save that money if you just do this amount of, the, of heroin. Or, and then lo and behold, they get a hold of some carfentanil, dead. Robert Bogues obliterated is, much of his life and the lives of so many others with drugs. First by using them and then by selling them. Lesson number one, pay attention to the early signs and put a stop to it. The kids are always gonna work, start working with what's out of mom and dad's medicine chest or what they can get online. Sober now five years, he's sharing his story in hopes of making up for his past mistakes by trying to help save lives. This former drug dealer who faced addiction, prison, homelessness, and almost daily danger on the streets selling addictive drugs, now reduced to tears when talking about his face-to-face -face meeting with parents of drug-addicted children. Each parent introduced themselves and, uh, you know, how they lost their kids to drugs. And it's the first time I've ever sat in front of parents like that, that um, just didn't know what to do. What he did was tell them the one. truth. Do they want to hear that I'm sorry because I represent the drug dealer that sold them the drugs at that point? But more than anything, I wanted to, to them to understand the reality and the truth about addiction, that their kids weren't themselves. Robert says he was not that different from other kids growing up. He was looking to be popular in high school. Academics and athletics didn't deliver prestige. Selling pot did. Oh, it was the power. Popularity? It, yeah, it was the popularity. I was the guy. I had the joints out in the parking lot, and, and that was probably coincides with the actual paying for my own pot. I think it was more of the power. He was using drugs to pay for his own. It's how he and most dealers get started. Then you blink and suddenly you've progressed into a big time dealer. Cocaine, heroin, crystal meth, he has seen and sold it all and has nothing to show for it. I don't know anybody that came out of it with everything. I don't know anybody either, you're gonna, jails, institutions, and death is what we say, but I don't know any drug dealer that didn't end up doing time, that had his money packed away. Sooner or later, the law catches up with everybody. Telling me he has never seen anything quite like the grip prescription pills has on our communities. I don't know how many people I know that are hooked on Adderall, but they believe because it's prescribed, 
that it's okay. Insisting big time dealers and drug gangs don't have to bother selling pills. The pharmaceutical companies have flooded America with enough pills to create an unlimited supply of addicts. Once hooked on painkillers, Robert says it's easy to convince someone heroin is cheaper and stronger. Today, heroin is where the serious drug dealers make their millions. His message to you and your family, if you or someone you love is addicted, get into recovery today. It's progressive. If I was hooked on drugs and knowing where I was going to lead, if I can get that concept to them, then they might change their mind and do something about it because it's, it's, it's going to happen. Saying parents need to pay attention primarily to your kids' smartphones. Kids can and do buy drugs right from the cell phone. You're the kid. I'm the parent. You're not going to have a phone. You're not going to be on the Internet. You're not going to ac access to all this. Robert says he didn't grow up wanting to be an addict. He didn't grow up wanting to be a drug dealer. But it is the road he took. And now he's traveling the road of recovery, hoping to reach thousands of others who will follow the path. Robert says we are failing in every category when it comes to the opioid addiction, police, prevention, education, treatment, and recovery. He says that has to change if America is going to survive this epidemic. Coming up after the break, we'll take a look at what opioid abuse does to the body and a look at the characteristics of an addict. Plus a one-on-one -on -one with the agencies in charge of dismantling pharmaceutical fraud that's a complex piece to this epidemic. We'll be right back. Let's celebrate San Antonio. Download the free SA300 app. Make plans with the event calendar. Gear up and show your pride. Get alerts, stories, news, and more. 2018 is going to be big. It'll be a year to celebrate our history and make it. And you don't want to miss a thing. With the SA300 app, you'll stay connected to it all. Make 2018 a year to remember. Download your free SA300 app now. Powered on KSAT 12 by Frost Bank and Sierra Cars, Trucks, and RVs and the Children's Hospital of San Antonio. I took my first handful of pills, and that's when all my priorities seemed to change. He would ask to use the bathroom in other people's homes. He just assumed that they would have medication. He'd go in their medicine cabinets and steal prescription drugs. I wish I knew really what these prescription pills were. We were so naive about the whole drug thing. These are all synthetic forms of heroin. Keep your medication locked up because you'll never notice that a pill is gone. Mind your meds. Learn more from the Partnership for Drug-Free Kids. My mother went to the doctor one morning and received 100 tramadol. By the next morning, most of them was gone. She was taking 10 at a time to get the high she was missing. Well, this day she never woke up. On the front lines of the opioid epidemic are agencies charged with unraveling complex, often dangerous criminal schemes. Dylan Collier spoke with investigators dismantling pharmaceutical fraud one case at a time. This has been decades in the making, and it just reached to a fever pitch. For agents with Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General, the mission is to bust down the front door of an issue unhindered by state lines. It doesn't matter where you go in the country, there's some level of problem that's, that's going on. Michael Cohen is a former physician's assistant who now helps federal agents sift through cases against providers, pharmacies, and manufacturers. You're okay taking one corner of the property? Yeah. It's an illegal industry fueled by kickbacks and a nation fixated on pills. We actually consume more hydrocodone than the rest of the world combined. We, we like our opioids in this country. We have seen that fraud schemes tend to be regional in nature. Joseph Martin is a Houston-based assistant special agent in charge for HHS OIG. So as people learn, how to do things and they move from one area to another, they sort of bring the scheme with them. The deception, at times, is nearly impossible to detect. I will be right with you. Sometimes a pharmacy will take a prescription and short the filling of the prescription by two or three pills. So then, you know, one or two pills per prescription will add up over time and then those pills can be diverted. One other obstacle agents are dealing with, drug blogs. People use opioids mixed with other drugs, chasing the ultimate high, then share their experiences on the internet. 
We're not talking about dark web material. This is open source information. People are no longer just taking a handful of pills. They have certain refinement methods of distilling the drug down to its pure product. Cohen says an opioid overdose almost always involves multiple drugs, which may be one reason why, even though the number of prescription pills prescribed in the U.S. is down, deaths are up putting opioids on par with past drug crises. It's possible that we've started to see the peak, but I can't say for sure yet. While taking prescription opioids can help with relieving pain, abusing them can in turn affect your body negatively. In the brain, opioid abuse can cause daytime sedation and drowsiness. In the nervous system, it can increase sensitivity to pain and cause loss of coordination. It can also affect your immune system, increasing susceptibility to infections. And abusing opioids through injections can cause veins to collapse or clog blood vessels. A professor at a Virginia Tech Research Institute is leading the nation in studying the characteristics of those who are addicted to substances. As Patty Santos reports, he describes the opioid epidemic as the perfect storm after more than 30 years worth of research. Dr. Warren Bickle says his research shows how you see your future plays a role in addiction. He calls your outlook on life future time perspective. His research has found the average person thinks of their future in terms of about the next five years. But addicts on average only think of the next nine days. This concept of short term focus sparked his interest after a conversation decades ago with a man excited to try a deadly batch of heroin. He said, haven't you been reading the paper? There's such pure heroin on the streets of Baltimore that people are overdosing. I had to try some, right? So when I heard that, I said, this is unbelievable. I said, if I could understand, you know, because it's not like there's a lack of knowledge. The question remains, though, what comes first? Does an addict begin thinking of their future beyond nine days and then quit drugs? Or do they get clean before starting to think long term? Dr. Bickle says his research is a step in answering that question and could soon lead to better treatment practices. One group of individuals who can be susceptible to the addiction of painkillers are athletes. Because with sports come injuries and athletes have the added pressure of returning to the field. The goal is to get them back out onto the playing field or playing surface as soon as possible. You can't be snowing them with opiates and narcotics. In a study done at the University of Michigan, researchers found that adolescent athletes who participated in competitive sports had two times greater odds of being prescribed painkillers and had four times greater odds of medically misusing them. They concluded that by the time high school athletes become seniors, approximately 11% will have used a narcotic pain reliever, such as Oxycontin or Vicodin, for non-medical purposes. I was sitting just like you, listening to guys come up and talk. NFL Hall of Famer Jerome the Bus Bettis says he's lucky to have never dealt with a serious injury that required medication, but he's seen other players struggle and wants to bring awareness to the addiction. There were some horror stories about guys that uh, abused uh, the, the pain medication, and it, it didn't start big, it started small, uh, and it started because of an injury, but then after that injury was healed, you still saw that those issues uh, linger. Coming up, San Antonio leads the state in infant opioid withdrawal. How one hospital has created a program to help those babies and their mothers have a clean life. Plus, next after the break, Paul Venema takes us into Drug Court, a program that helps addicts rebuild their lives and shares the stories of some of the people who have gone through the program. We'll be right back. As Harvey hit the coast, San Antonio turned to KSAT. We're going to be here most of the night. Thousands turned to San Antonio. No one will be turned away. Everyone that we spoke with was just really grateful for the hospitality that our city has shown. We are seeking volunteers, and Red Cross is training those up. Devastation along the coast, flooding in Houston. Expect the latest from KSAT and expect more from San Antonio. The community is gathering here to send help where it's needed. Thank you, San Antonio, for taking care of your fellow Texans and staying with KSAT 12.
Who else has been taking your prescriptions? Keep your medicine and your family safe and secure. Mind your meds. To learn how we can help, visit the Partnership for Drug-Free Kids at drugfree.org. She lost everything. Her husband, her child, her friends and family. She's currently serving a 12-year sentence in prison. This from a beautiful woman who had every opportunity in life. A major weapon in the battle against opioid addiction in Bear County is a place called Felony Drug Court. It's what's called a specialty court that deals only with drug offenders through intensive judicial supervision. Paul Venema takes a look at the court and introduces us to some of the program's participants. You could change your life with meds or just talking to somebody. Woven through this group of people in drug court is a lot of hurt, sadness, disappointment, and hope. I was in a spot where I could be quiet and just listen to God, and, and I got willing. Paul Mullen, a second-year law student, is talking about his first days here eight years ago. I got into Vicodin. I'd carry him around in a Pez dispenser. The pills were an answer to his troubles as a teenager. Addiction, in my mind, was never the problem. Addiction was the solution. The, using the pills was the solution to the various problems. The girlfriend's furious, take the pills. The parents are furious, take the pills. You know, you're failing out of school, take the pills. Finding drugs, he said, was easy. In that circle of friends that just likes to party and does whatever, there was always somebody who, who you could get opiates from. Weary of using and fearing jail time, he asked to be sent here. Morning, folks. Morning. I think we're making some pretty good strides. District Judge Ernie Glenn runs the drug court. Probably going to be referred over to do MRT with Craig. It's a combination of judicial oversight and treatment of a problem that's been on the increase. He said that he's seen an increase of 50% in opioid addiction over the past five years. That's good. So you had a plan. Everything's going to work out. Judge Glenn is firm but friendly and insists on commitment. A lot of it has to do with just holding our clients accountable. That is no problem for Alexander Winningham. This program and my girlfriend basically saved my life. An athlete who loved to play basketball, his Vicodin abuse began as many do, innocently enough. He was being treated by a doctor for pain from a basketball injury. Injury. Rolled my ankle completely under and, you know, just started getting prescribed Vicodin. The prescription didn't last long enough to satisfy what had become an addiction. Once that ran out, it's not hard here in San Antonio to find anything. Yeah, just on the streets, anywhere. He was hooked. It was never enough, you know. Even if I didn't feel pain, I'd still just be numbing myself out. Finishing up the first phase of the 18-month program here, he's proud of his progress. Court every single week. I got classes three days a week, individual counseling once a week, so it's like I have a job I'm not getting paid for, but it has immense benefits. I lost everyone that I loved, that I cared about. Princess Frail also giving the program rave reviews. I was in the streets. I was living the life that I never thought I would live. Pills were not her problem. She was hooked on heroin, an addiction that resulted in family problems, money problems, and eventually jail time. Enter drug court. Now I know that God has a purpose for me. I'm here today, I'm alive. I've been sober for two years. I was in the street. I didn't care about nobody. I didn't even care about myself. She shares a similar backstory of living on the streets as Ashley Mills and she shares her commitment. I never give up, no matter what. Being here, walking through these courtroom doors has taught me to never give up. The judge said keeping the program running is a challenge, but he's optimistic about support he's getting from the government and from the medical community. Participants are given this letter that must be signed by their doctor. It asks for their assistance. They give them opiates or you know, some other things that it might just continue their addiction on or just make it worse. Judge Glenn is candid when it comes to the program's future. It's going to take a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of treatment. He's got a handle on the time and treatment. The money comes from grants and from the government. We need the state, we need the county, we need the city, we need them to all, you know, step up. The payoff, Glenn says, is worth the investment. He says that the county has already saved millions of dollars. And it will continue to save millions of dollars as those people don't get rearrested and go back through the criminal justice system. 
City and county leaders are taking the opioid epidemic seriously. They've created a joint opioid task force with the University Health System to come up with solutions to this complex problem. Mayor Ron Nierberg said that we don't have to wait for a crisis level to get a handle on what we know is coming. Right now, our community leads the state in infant opioid withdrawal and has the third highest rate of overdose deaths in Texas. <laughs> Newborn babies are the most vulnerable victims. That's why one local hospital has created a program to help them and their mothers who are addicted to opioids. One woman we spoke to says the program changed her and her baby's life. Tiffany Huerta spoke to health care providers who are on the front lines in the battle against this epidemic. I was putting my own baby in danger and I couldn't stop. I wasn't getting enough for the pain. And that's when I found out about heroin. It hasn't been an easy road to recovery for eight-month-old Gracie and her mother, Victoria Ortiz. She just started getting fever. She was crying. She had to run. Gracie was born fighting withdrawal symptoms from opiates. Something called neonatal abstinence syndrome, or NAS. When I saw her sick and like going through all that pain that I caused her, that she did nothing to do, you know, to deserve it. San Antonio has got the highest rate of NAS in Texas, and in fact, it's got more NAS cases than Houston and Dallas combined. In 2015, 324 babies receiving Medicaid benefits in Bear County were born with NAS, according to the Texas Department of Health and Human Services. Gracie's mother, Victoria Ortiz, says her life changed at the hospital. CPS got involved, you know, when she was born. Uh, they were wanting to, you know, take her away. Um, Susie caught her resources. Susie Aldis works at the neonatal intensive care unit at Baptist Medical Center in downtown San Antonio. Aldis says three years ago, they changed the way they dealt with mothers in similar situations. We have an orphanage here just for babies in San Antonio. And we had three babies in a row that went to that orphanage because there were no foster homes. All the foster homes were full. That's when the NAS team decided to change the way they help families. Last year, 85% of our moms that came in went into a treatment program. The NAS program encourages mothers and babies to stay together. We see an earlier discharge with less need for medications for those moms who are engaged, who are always visiting the baby. We put baby skin to skin with mom and keep them there as long as possible. A unique part of the program is in here. They have volunteers who spend time rocking the babies, withdrawing from opiates. <coughs> Ortiz and Gracie were moved to the NAS home, an inpatient facility for mothers and their children with 24-hour supervision. This is what I love about the hospital and the program is that they really fight for you. Ortiz has now been sober for eight months and hopes to continue living a healthy life. She's big and starting to stand up and crawling and stuff. We're doing real good, you know, because of the restoration home. What is it? Coming up in the next segment, Tiffany is going to introduce us to another mother, one who she met up with the first night she checked into the NAS program and began detox while 34 weeks pregnant. If you need help overcoming an addiction, we have a resource guide online at keysat.com slash addiction. We have an article with a list of substance abuse and addiction resources available in Bear County. Just look for this story. A hidden needle will poke them just the same as it will poke us. First responders have a dangerous job, but the opioid epidemic brings new concerns. Coming up after the break, Courtney Friedman speaks to a local EMS responder to learn how they're changing their routines when responding to an overdose. And after the break, more of this dramatic video from one of our sister stations that shows first responders bringing a woman back to life after she overdosed thanks to a certain overdose reversal drug. We'll be right back. Hurricane Harvey has left thousands in need in Houston and along the Texas coast. Make a difference this month by helping to stock the San Antonio Food Bank. Every Thursday in September, KSAC Community and Corner Store will be holding food drives. This week, drop-offs are being collected at this location between 9 a.m. and 7 p.m. Help your fellow Texans with food, new clothing, diapers, toiletries, and cleaning supplies. KSAC Community, in partnership with Corner Store, University Health System, and Security Service Federal Credit Union. That is a pretty good breakfast. You're not even eating. Not hungry. No? Why not? What's up? Kath and I knew that Jenny had been partying a bit. 
Found out she tried heroin. Most people don't know what to say about drugs, but we do. Visit us at drugfree.org. My husband kept telling our daughter over and over about the chances of fentanyl being cut into the heroin she was getting. He described it as a game of Russian roulette. On March 27th of this year, our daughter, who had just turned 23 years old, overdosed upstairs in her bedroom above ours. She unknowingly injected a syringe filled with more fentanyl than heroin. We laid her here. I don't know if anybody's seen the movie Pulp Fiction, but it was pretty much like that. Narcan saved her life. An amazing rescue in Orlando, captured by our sister station, WKMG. A 23-year-old woman overdosing on heroin, but was brought back to life by a deputy who used an overdose reversal drug, Noxalone, also known as Narcan. The life-saving act happening right in front of the woman's mother. And it was startling, and it was numbing, and it was scary. Especially when she sat right up. According to the CDC, government agencies have been stocking up on Narcan for the last two decades, but didn't really need it until recent years. The latest study from 2015 shows the number of organizations providing Narcan increased by 183%, saving more than 26,000 lives. And the epidemic has only gotten worse since that study. One of the riskiest situations for all first responders is an opioid overdose. Despite all the training they get, responding to an overdose is unpredictable. Courtney Friedman explains why it's becoming even more dangerous for them. Their functions start to come back, but yet they, they, they're mentally not always there. This is where San Antonio firefighter and paramedic Bob Beckett spends most of his time. This is where we put our patients. It's where he saves lives and risks his own. Opioid overdose, first thing we're going to do is breathe for, the, for our patients using an ambu bag. His only choice to get up close and personal. Right here in the back of this ambulance, which is like a big closet, there's usually four or five people and a patient right here. You're right on top of them. All opioid overdoses don't involve addicts, but Beckett says many do. The opioid of choice on the streets of San Antonio is heroin, which means needles are usually nearby. We sometimes will have PD do searches on them to try to discover those kind of things to not put us in danger. So if our members get stuck, we're at risk for hepatitis B, HIV, hepatitis C, which is a big risk for our firefighters and our EMTs. Dr. David Miramontes is the fire department's medical director through UT Health San Antonio. He has very specific procedures in place for when responders are exposed. I have one whole nurse that all she does is infection control for the fire department. We test the patient, we test the medic for a baseline, and we start the medic or firefighter on three drug cocktail of HIV meds. We've had many exposures, but thank goodness, because of our aggressive treatment protocols, no one has converted to HIV positive. San Antonio firefighters and paramedics have to get a minimum of four annual vaccinations. Those are hepatitis B, MMR, influenza, and chickenpox. Police have a separate medical system, but response is almost identical. For both departments, concern for safety grows, along with the opioid epidemic. Many major cities have begun to see fentanyl abuse on their streets. Fentanyl is 100 times more potent than morphine or heroin. More importantly, law enforcement has a huge risk to exposure from the powder. We have actually very pure heroin as it comes right over the border. We're one of the first cut cities. So we don't have a huge problem with fentanyl in our area yet. But he expects a much bigger presence soon. So for responders, class is constantly in session. It's coming and we're working on getting continuing education all the time. Whether the overdose is from heroin or fentanyl, Narcan is the drug that saves the patient. As a shot or nasal mist, it blocks the effects of opioids. Some police and all SAFD EMTs carry it with them. It's safer for us to use this as a mist as opposed to having to deal with needles to where you might have some contaminants of blood or 
or a needle stick that would be dangerous. In an even better situation, a bystander or loved one has already used Narcan on the person overdosing. Um, I can go ahead and fax it over to your doctor's office. You can get it by prescription or some pharmacies now sell it over the counter. We will not have to do as many procedures upfront and personal with the patient if they're already been woken up with Narcan. We all want to go home to our families too. Every moment a risk. One Beckett promises is worth it. I've been a firefighter for 20 plus years and I love it. I, I love helping people. It's actually a pretty cool thing to see somebody that is overdosed and we can change that. He'll continue saving lives swept up by America's swelling opioid problem, gambling his own along the way. First responders also consider using masks and eye protection when dealing with exposure to dangerous powders or bodily fluids. Each situation is different, so they assess each situation as it comes and decide whether extra protection is needed. In the last segment, we told you about the NAS program at Baptist Medical Center that helps newborns and their mothers who are addicted to opioids. Tiffany Huertas is now following the journey of a local mother who admits to making many mistakes but is now getting clean for her baby. Wild and crazy and prostituting and, and drugs. I don't want her out there. I want her to be under my roof. So I used uh, crack cocaine and heroin. Since a young age, Crystal Gutierrez had to face abuse. At nine years old, I was... I was molested by my stepdad. As years passed, it only became harder for Gutierrez. Growing up fast, you know, uh, in and out of the streets and disrespecting, you know, my family. At 16, I got shot and um, I lost my best friend. Gutierrez is 34 weeks pregnant. The 26-year-old sits in a hospital bed, dehydrated, tired, and sleepy. Doctors say she just used heroin. Our primary concern is to find out if she's stable, and at the same time, keeping a very close eye on the baby. <laughs> Baptist Medical Center gave Gutierrez an opportunity to get better through their NAS program. Gutierrez and her baby will go through the methadone program first. We've now found that if we have the mothers rooming in with the baby and there is a greater bonding between mother and baby, uh, it takes less time to detox off the heroin. But this isn't Gutierrez's first child. When the baby was born, she stayed in the NICU for over a month and a half. Gutierrez's mother, Lucia Cortez, has stood by her side since the beginning. All I want you to know is that I love you and I've always been behind you. <laughs> and even though I put my foot down and I shut my doors on you, that was the only way I needed you to hit rock bottom. <laughs> So that way you can see that there's nothing good out there. Gutierrez admits there is a lot of hard work ahead, but believes she is headed in the right direction. How does it feel hearing the heartbeat of your baby? Oh, it was awesome. <laughs> it felt so good to know that, that the baby's okay. Because, uh, you know, living crazy every day and getting high and stuff, there wasn't a day that or a second <laughs> that went by that I wasn't like, um, is the baby okay? Her family is now hoping she completes this program and gets a second chance at life. Kay said asked to follow Gutierrez during her journey in the NAS program, and Crystal and her family have agreed to share her story. So in the next few weeks, we will bring you more on Crystal Gutierrez's progress. For many, the opioid addiction doesn't start on the streets. It starts with a prescription from a doctor. Coming up next, why one woman says her addiction could have been prevented if her doctor only asked more questions. Plus, because of the rising numbers in overdose deaths, doctors are changing the way they do their practice. Coming up, how one physician is putting himself at the center of his treatment program to help addicts get their lives back. We'll be right back after this.
Scams, corruption, cover-ups. KSAT's defenders don't just track down those at fault. We do more. We hold them accountable. Depend on the defenders to dig deeper, to ask the tough questions. And to get the answers you deserve. Was there ever a point where you started having concerns? You are not a charitable organization. We, we have... Months of investigation. We'll take it on. Confronting the powerful. We're there. Facts matter, and San Antonio deserves the truth. Expect the defenders to hold them accountable. I took my first handful of pills, and that's when all my priorities seemed to change. He would ask to use the bathroom in other people's homes. He just assumed that they would have medication. He'd go in their medicine cabinets and steal prescription drugs. I wish I knew really what these prescription pills were. We were so naive about the whole drug thing. These are all synthetic forms of heroin. Keep your medication locked up because you'll never notice that a pill is gone. Mind your meds. Learn more from the Partnership for Drug-Free Kids. Did your doctor ever ask you any questions like, do you have a, a past history no. of addiction? Never. Of drinking, drugs, nothing? Never. For many, their opioid addiction didn't start on the streets, but with a legal prescription for pain from a doctor or someone we trust. But if doctors don't vet patients thoroughly enough, they could be contributing to a bigger problem instead of helping. That was the case for Allison Puryam. She became addicted to painkillers and lost everything. Most importantly, the custody of her two and four year old children. Allison said she was hooked after a month into her prescription. She started to take more because she thought if one was good, two or three would make her feel even better. And once her prescription ran out, she knew what to do to feed her body's urges. When I would start calling my doctor and I would tell him I was in a lot of pain, so I took more than I was supposed to. The milligrams of it is not working. I need something stronger. I need a higher dose. Uh, and he would, he would do it. He would call it in for me. Early research showed opioids are safe and effective for treating pain. The problem with that research is that it was in safe patients at lower doses for shorter durations, and there wasn't a whole lot of attention being brought towards the adverse effects. While most doctors have good intentions, it's important that they are all thinking about the long-term effects of these prescriptions. The only thing that I would, I'm angry about is that they never told me um, you know, like when you smoke cigarettes, there's a warning label on the side. There was no warning label on my, my prescription bottle. It just said it might make you drowsy, don't operate heavy machinery. It never said you might become addicted to this. I think we all are to blame, and I think we all need to stand up and look ourselves in the mirror. The opioid epidemic has really changed the way doctors conduct their practices. Because the addiction knows no race or economic status, it's become difficult for doctors to know where to draw the line when it comes to prescribing painkillers. It's also made some doctors change the way they treat addicts. Devin Clark spoke with Dr. Adam Brogeman at the Other Side Treatment Center in Chavano Park, who is changing rehabilitation by putting the doctor at the center of the treatment team. The problem with opiates goes across every single person. It's, it's our neighbors, it's our family members, uh, it's the people we run into at various community locations throughout town. While the opioid epidemic in San Antonio may not be as bad as other parts of the country, it is still a very real crisis here and around Texas, and it is very serious. Opiates are very easily fallen into addiction because we don't see them as a problem. They're something that's prescribed to us by someone we trust, a physician. Where was that approximately? And ultimately, we become tolerant to them and continue to take more and take more until ultimately the patients cannot get off the medications. Dr. Adam Brueggemann has just opened a new intensive outpatient program on the city's north side called the Other Side Treatment Center. As a physician in San Antonio since 2012, he's had firsthand experience with the opioid crisis that so many are dealing with and dying from. It's really hard to cause doctors to pause, but opiates have really caused us to pause. We run drug tests on patients all the time, and there are certain people that you just kind of get a feeling for going to be positive for something that you weren't expecting or something that you didn't write for. But the truth is the people that surprise us the most are the ones we least expect. Dr. Brueggemann says when it comes to the opioid addiction, physicians are usually wrong about 30% of the time when it comes to identifying who is affected. And it's not just doctors who have to be careful who they're prescribing the medication to. Patients have to be careful as well. Even if they're not addicted, leaving the medication stored or unused in the home or giving them to a loved one thinking you're helping them could ultimately be harming them. So we put them in a medicine cabinet. Those can be a, become a real problem, whether it's 
um, teenage children or college age children who begin to experiment with the medications. The reason why people take opiates really is to get away from things. It's, it's an escape. It's important to recognize these signs of addiction to prevent someone we know or love from becoming part of the statistic. 91 people die every day in the United States from opioid addiction. The numbers continue to climb so much so that more people die every year in the United States from either heroin or from opiate abuse more so than die from car accidents. And how much do we talk about texting while driving? How much do we talk about uh, not drinking while driving? And yet more people are dying from use of opiates including heroin than they are dying from these horrible car accidents that we see every day on the news. For many, the opioid addiction leads to a more serious addiction, heroin. It's a very similar drug and provides the same neurological symptoms. It's also a lot cheaper, making it a quick and easy fix when addicts can no longer get a prescription for opioids. They'll have intense cravings for the medications. Uh, they'll count down the hours until they can get their next medication. Dr. Brueggemann agrees that physicians and drug companies are both to blame for the country's opioid epidemic. He says every time doctors come to a solution for the opioid crisis, it's always another medication, getting them further and further into trouble. And the pharmaceutical industry is in the business to sell those medications, leaving it up to doctors and lawmakers to stop the pharmaceutical industry from influencing the practice of medicine. So I think it's given us a much stronger awareness as to how industry has influenced our practices and allowed us to huddle together as a group of physicians and say we really need to be smart about who we allow in our doors and how we make our decisions. You know, one of the interesting things that Dr. Brogeman mentioned to us is that when someone is an alcoholic, it's easy to tell them not to have another drink of alcohol again. But when someone becomes addicted to opioids, it's not easy to say that they will never need a painkiller again because we don't know if that's true. There is such a fine line when it comes to the opioid addiction. America's epidemic of drug overdose deaths has produced a dramatic rise in the number of donated organs for people on transplant waiting lists. And while there may be a stigma associated with organ donations from overdose deaths, medical officials say they are actually very acceptable donors. Around 10,000 donors die each year, and about 13% of those deaths are from opioid overdoses. That's a little over 1,200 people a year. David Klassen is the chief medical officer at the Network for Organ Sharing. He says a lot of people don't understand that people that die from overdoses can become donors. He wants to bring more awareness to that because it could save someone else's life. I think it's something that surprises a lot of people because clearly people think of organ donation and typically they think of traumatic accidents. But now drug overdose is a big part of uh, the organ donation process or, or the organ donation programs in the United States. Hospitals are required to test organs and warn patients if there's a risk for contracting HIV or hepatitis B or C. But Klassen says the risk is very low, less than 1%. Despite the increase in available organs, there's no sign that the supply is keeping up with the demand. To take a look at opioid use through the history in the U.S., head over to kset.com slash addiction. Poppy-derived products used as medicine dates back to 3400 B.C. They became more popular as a painkiller during the Civil War. I'm Marcia, what's your name? Coming up after the break, a look at alternative treatments to the opioid addiction. Scientists in Houston are using virtual reality to help addicts fight the craving for drugs. And some other countries are using what's called heroin-assisted treatment to help addicts. Coming up next, why this form of alternative treatment is controversial to many here in the U.S. We'll be right back. Thursday on GMSA, thousands of children wait for a permanent family while they're in the foster care system. Find out how one school teacher is helping all these kids. Will it be cool enough for a jacket or sweatshirt Thursday morning? Find out 437 on Good Morning San Antonio. KSAT's defenders don't just track down those at fault. We do more. We hold them accountable. Depend on the defenders to dig deeper, to ask the tough questions. San Antonio deserves the truth. Expect the defenders to hold them accountable. Who else has been taking your prescriptions? Keep your medicine and your family safe and secure. Mind your meds. To learn how we can help, visit the Partnership for Drug-Free Kids at drugfree.org.
She's too embarrassed to face any family member because this is not the stay-at-home mom we knew. I follow all news stories I find and wait day and night to hear a knock on my door that my daughter Odie was killed out there on the streets. She panhandles for money for drugs. People always give her money. Smuggling drugs across the border is a big problem for the DEA and Border Patrol agents that they face every day. Here's a look at heroin seizures along the Mexico-Texas border from 2014 to 2015. In the Rio Grande Valley sector, there was a 143% increase with 275 kilograms of heroin smuggled in. But the Laredo sector saw no change with 160 kilograms of heroin still being smuggled in. The Del Rio sector saw a 196% increase with 29 kilograms of heroin smuggled in. But the Big Bend sector saw a decrease by 90% with 2 kilograms of heroin smuggled in. As did the El Paso sector, decreasing by 41% with 56 kilograms of heroin smuggled. But in some countries, heroin is being used as an alternative treatment for opioid addicts. Heroin-assisted treatment provides severely addicted people with controlled access to pharmaceutical grade heroin. An expert from Rice University believes it could make a significant dent in the number of U.S. deaths from opioid use. According to the CDC, of the 52,404 drug overdose deaths in the U.S. in 2015, roughly 63 percent involved an opioid. Katherine Harris works at the Baker Institute for Public Policy at Rice University. She says heroin-assisted treatment, or HAT, is a well-established treatment method that was available in the U.S. until the early 2000s. And the program is still used in several countries, such as Germany, Belgium, and the U.K. The idea behind these programs is really a harm reduction model. It's the fact that if a person's not going to stop using, let's provide them a way to use that's safe for them, that takes away their need to commit crime to support their habit and that might bring stability to their lives. But the HAT program is controversial in the U.S. and the political barriers are high. Harris says it's because of the negative perceptions of heroin. But she believes scientific evidence should drive policy decisions, not perceptions. In Switzerland, for example, where the program is most known, heroin-assisted treatment declined the heroin-dependent population from about 30,000 in 1992 down to 26,000 in 2002. Another type of alternative treatment is being developed just up the road on I-10. Houston scientists are working on groundbreaking research to help prevent and treat the opioid crisis. As Max Massey explains, the virtual reality program isn't necessarily a replacement to traditional therapy, but it could help change their thinking before they pick up a needle. Hey, come on in. I'm Marcia. What's your name? Tucked away in a small room at the University of Houston is a cave. Is that here? Inside this cave, researchers are using virtual reality to help addicts kick their heroin addiction. I believe that it is um, the first in the nation around to be able to investigate the use of this technology around heroin and opiates. Mickey Washburn oversees day-to-day -day operations of the lab. This is very cutting edge. Addicts put on the virtual reality headset, navigate through a house party setting, then eight cameras project life-sized 3D images on the walls in the room. Details like an open pizza box to a spoon and syringe on a table are meant to enhance sensations and trigger a heroin craving. In this controlled environment, we're teaching them coping skills. If we try to do this in the real world, going out into the street with them so that they can see the house where they last injected or the people that sell to them or the people that inject with, with them, that poses dangers. Luis Torres is the director of the center. He says this virtual reality wouldn't replace traditional therapy. It would be in addition to it. If we can have multiple tools to help people who are trying to combat their addiction, we're giving them a better chance of success. And there are potentially more breakthroughs coming out of Houston. One anesthesiologist is leading a clinical trial that would prevent people from becoming addicted to opioids in the first place by using this goo. A recent paper in the Journal of the American Medical Association showed 6% of people after minor or major surgery are still using opioids three months out. In fact, opioid addiction can set in in as little as seven days. 
So Dr. Harold Minkowitz is testing out a potential miracle solution in the operating room. After the surgery ends, the special goo is placed over the wound. Then the wound is closed up. The patient then goes off to the recovery room. The opioid use ends once the patient leaves the operating room. Post-op surgery after that, when we went home, I didn't actually need any medication. It actually was really good. There was minimal pain. The clinical trial is a double-blind study, so the doctors nor the patient know which is the placebo group and which is the testing group. Trials and research can take years to prove effective, but Houston on the forefront of a more immediate remedy. Pharmacies are also trying to do what they can to fight the opioid epidemic. Stores like CVS and Walgreens sell timer caps to prevent prescription drug abuse. The timer cap automatically starts counting the minutes and hours since it was last closed, and it doesn't reopen until it's time to take the next dose. The built-in stopwatch and patented activation makes it tamper-resistant, so you know when to take your next dose, or if someone has been into your medication, the exact minute that it happened. The timer caps are just one of many tools pharmacists can use to do their job in keeping drugs off the streets. As pharmacists, we have several tools um, that we use, like our prescription monitoring program that is run through the state of Texas, which allows us to know when and where somebody filled a controlled substance last. So that really helps us as pharmacists to know if they're doctor shopping or if they're using multiple pharmacies. The timer cap has proven to help people take their medication as prescribed by up to 33%. You can purchase them for around $10. Okay. The timer cap also helps patients avoid driving under the influence by knowing when it's safe to take the wheel again after taking the medication. The opioid epidemic is also hitting the streets. The Bear County Sheriff's Office Narcotics Unit sees the opioid problem here in the county. Prostitutes under the influence almost all of the time. We follow that unit as they go undercover. Coming up at 10, we also speak to a woman who at first used prescription pills and later it turned into addiction. If you or someone you know suffers from an opioid addiction and needs help, call the Center for Healthcare Services at 210-223-SAFE or 1-800-316-9241. You can also find more resources online at ksat.com slash addiction.